Have you ever wondered how hackers crack or patch software or video games and make it available for everyone around the world? This process is very easy from the pirate's end. All you gotta do is to replace the program executable and some DLLs with the modified ones. To you, this process is very trivial, you just copy and paste files. But from the hackers or the crackers end, this process could also be very trivial and could be very challenging, depending on what they are dealing with. So today, we'll go through this process and understand how it's actually done. I am not expecting you to have any knowledge at all regarding reverse engineering, just a little bit of C programming will be good enough. Let's say we have the symbol C program here that checks if the entered password equals to password123. If it's correct, we print success, if not, we print try again. Let's compile this program and run it. Now, let's assume that we don't know what the correct password is. What can we do here? The very first thing that we can do is to look for the hard-coded strings inside the executable. And we can do that using strings, the most powerful reverse engineering tool. The strings tool looks for printable ASCII characters inside the executable. We can see here the password 123 string listed among all the printable strings. So we can just try this password and see if it works. That's one way to do it. But what if the strings inside the executable weren't useful to us? In that case, we need to somehow get our hands on the original code of the executable so that we can analyze it. And in order to do that, we need a tool that takes the executable as an input and outputs a human readable code. These tools are called disassemblers. But before we load our program in a disassembler, let's first try to understand how a disassembler works. A disassembler works by taking the raw bytes inside the portable executable and converting them to the closest programming language to machine code, which is assembly. The portable executable consists of multiple sections. The code that you write is stored inside the text section. A disassembler takes the raw bytes stored inside the text section and converts them to assembly code. But still, how does the disassembler take in these random bytes and spit out these assembly instructions? Well, let me explain. Let's say we want to interpret or decode these bytes to an actual assembly instruction. Let's start with the first byte, which is hex48. The very first thing that we need to do is to get the binary representation of hex48, which maps to 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. The most significant four bits here are called the REX prefix. The moment you see this prefix, that means you're going to be working with 64-bit operands or registers. 64-bit registers are always prefixed with the letter R. Now, the last four bits here are called the WRXB bits. Each bit here has a specific meaning. This bit indicates the operand size. If it's set to 1, that means we're going to be working with 64-bit registers. If it's set to 0, we're going to be working with 32-bit registers. The last three bits here indicate whether are we going to be working with low registers or high registers. We'll get back to those three bits in a sec. Let's just move on to the next byte, which is hex AB. This is one of the upcodes of the move instruction and it indicates that the source will be a memory address and the destination will be a register. The last byte is the mode RM byte. The most significant two bits here indicate the mode or the need of displacement. Zero zero here means that there will be no displacement. What I mean by displacement is the number of bytes we need to add to the address inside the base register to obtain the exact value that we want. The next three bits indicate which register the REG field will be. From this table, we can see that 011 maps to the RBX register. The last three bits indicate the base register, which maps to RA. So, to recap, from the first byte you will learn that the size of the operands are 64 bit. The second byte is one of the upcodes of the move instruction that indicates that the source will be a memory address and the destination will be a register. And from the last byte, we will learn that there is no displacement. The RBX register is used in the REG field and the RAX register will be the base register. Let's go through another example just for clarification. Let's decode this instruction. We first have hex 49 which maps to 01001001. We have the REX prefix again, that means we're going to be working with 64-bit operands. Then we have the WRXB bits with W and B set to 1. Again, this bit means that we're going to be using 64-bit registers and this bit means a high base register will be used. High registers are the registers from R8 to R15. 
The next byte is hex 8b. Again, this byte indicates that this instruction is a move instruction. The source will be a memory address and the destination will be a register. The next byte is the mode rm byte. The first two bits are the mode. 0, 1 here means that there will be a displacement and the value of this displacement is the next byte, which is hex 8 or 8 bytes. The next three bits indicate the destination register. 001 maps to the RCX register. The last three bits also map to the RCX register. But wait from the first byte we have the bit of the base register set that means we will add a fourth bit here and from this table we can see that 1001 maps to the R9 register and also FYI we can reverse the source and the destination by simply replacing this hex 8 bit move upcode with the hex 89 move upcode simple as that this is how disassemblers work in general. We also have two main algorithms that are used by disassemblers to interpret the bytecode. Linear sweep and recursive descent. Linear sweep is good if you want a full disassembly of the code. But if there's a lot of functionality in the code, linear analysis of the assembly becomes hard. And in order to understand the functionality of the code better, we need a way to transform this linear assembly into a control flow graph. And this is where recursive descent comes in. This algorithm works by following the program's control flow recursively, exploring branches and targets of control flow instructions such as conditional and unconditional jumps, and also function calls. Fortunately for you as a beginner, you don't have to build your own disassembler from scratch, but it's always a good idea to understand how it works. Now, before we dive into how modern applications are protected or how they verify activation keys, let's first understand how to reverse engineer a simple program. Here I have our program from earlier loaded in Binary Ninja, and this is the disassembly of the main function of the program. Let's walk through each instruction. We first subtract hex 28 or 40 bytes from the stack pointer to allocate space for the local variables. Next, we move the second command line argument to the RCX register. RDX here has a pointer to the array of the command line arguments, meaning that the pointer in the RDX register points to the first command line argument, which is the executable name. And RDX plus 8 points to the second command line argument, which is the user input and so on. In x86-64, when the main function is called, the arguments count is passed to the RCX register. The pointer to the command line arguments array is passed to the RDX register. The pointer to the program environment variables is passed to the R8 register. So back here, after the second argument or the user input is passed to the RCX register, we move the length of the correct password, which is 11 characters plus a null byte, to the R8 register. Then we use the load effective address instruction to load the address of the correct password into the RDX register. And then we call the string in compare function. If the two passwords match, this function will return zero. If not, it will return one. And the return value will be stored inside the RAX register. Next instruction is test AX with AX. Under the hood, this instruction performs a bitwise AND between AX and itself and sets the zero flag to one if AX is set to zero. Or you can just say that it checks if the AX register is set to zero and sets the zero flag to one if so. Next, we load the addresses of the try again and the success strings into RDX and RCX respectively. Then we use the CMOV and E instruction. It stands for conditional move if not equal. This instruction checks if the zero flag is set to zero. And if so, it moves the address inside the RDX register to RCX. But since the zero flag is set to one, this instruction will not run. And hence the RCX register will still have the success message, which what we print in the next call. Always remember that in the Windows X64 calling convention, when the function is called, the arguments are passed to the register from left to right. For example, let's say we have a call to this function. At runtime, the arguments are passed in this order to the registers. The first argument is passed to RCX. The second argument is passed to RDX. The third and fourth arguments are passed to R8 and R9 respectively. And any more arguments will be pushed onto the stack. Keep in mind that this is only the case for Windows X64 calling conventions. On Linux and Mac OS, this is the correct order for passing arguments. But why this is so important to understand? Well, it's because when you want to write a certain shell code for a certain architecture, it's essential to understand how to use assembly to pass function arguments. We will dive deep into shell code development later in the malware development series. But anyways, now back in the code, since the printf function only has one argument, it will be passed to the RCX register, and then the function call is executed. After that, we XOR AX with itself to have our return value, which is zero. Keep in mind that anything XOR 
order with itself will always result in zero. After we have the return value in AEX, we add 40 bytes to the stack pointer register to completely free the stack of this function before we execute the return instruction, which pops the return address off of the stack into the RIB register or the instruction pointer register. Now let's level up the game a little bit and make it slightly harder, but this time I won't show you the source code. So here we start by subtracting hex 38 or 56 bytes from the stack pointer RSP. In case you don't know, the stack grows downwards and the stack pointer always points to the top of the stack. So whenever we want to make a space on the stack for the function local variables, we have to subtract some bytes from it for the local variables to be stored. And whenever we want to reference these variables, we can use either the stack pointer because it always points to the top of the stack, or we can use the base pointer because it's stored at the bottom of the stack right after the return address. So whenever you see a memory address being referenced relative to RPP or RSP, like here for example, that means you're looking at a local variable. So next, the second command line argument is moved inside the R8 register. RDX here points to the command line arguments array like we discussed earlier. The next instruction basically moves minus one to RAX and acts as a fail safe mechanism. Then we move these bytes to memory addresses referenced by the RSB register, which means we're looking at a local variable here or an array of bytes, but it's kind of reversed due to that little Indianus. To get the correct order of bytes, we have to rearrange the buffer from right to left, top to bottom in a zigzag like shape. Like so. After that, we have a knob instruction, which means no operation. So next, REX is incremented by one, and then it checks if the first byte in this address is equal to zero. We know from this instruction that the R8 register holds a pointer to our input. So here we basically loop through our input until we encounter hex zero or a null byte, which indicates end of string. So REX here acts as a counter or an index. And once this loop ends, REX will have the length of our input. So next we check if our input length is equal to hex b or 11 decimal. If so, we jump here. If not, we jump here and print this incorrect input links message. So now we know that the length of the correct password has to be 11 characters. And if you remember, this is the same length of the byte array that was being pushed onto the stack here. This simply means that this is the correct password, but it's encrypted or encoded, and we still need the key to decrypt it. So moving on, once we jump here, we XOR EDX with itself to set its value to zero. And then look at that, we load the address of the encrypted byte array to REX and then we subtract the address of the encrypted byte array from the address of our input so that we can use it as a base address down here. Next we load the address of the encrypted byte array into RCX and add to it RDX which was set to zero from here and it gets incremented also here. That means RDX here acts as a counter or an index. Then we load the first byte from our input into AX and XOR that byte with hex 19 or 25 in decimal. And then we compare the XOR byte with the first byte in the encrypted byte array. If they match, we jump here and increment RDX by one and check if it's equal to hex B or 11 in decimal. If not, we jump back here and continue the loop. So it's obvious now that the encrypted byte array is XOR with hex 19 or 25. So now we can write a simple Python script like this one to return the correct password. This is the process of reverse engineering in a nutshell. We can even speed up this process by using the compilers like Ida Hextrace or Ghidra. But still, this process can be as trivial as this simple crack me and also can be very frustrating. Modern software such as desktop applications and video games rely on many techniques to scare off hackers. One of these techniques is strings encryption. Using proper encryption algorithms like RC4 and not just relying on some XOR encoding like we did earlier. We can also compile multiple key checking algorithms to make the process of reverse engineering very tough. Also nowadays software developers rarely use local activation and instead they rely on online activation to prevent hackers from analyzing their software. So now if you want to crack a certain software that uses online activation, you will need to reverse engineer the program executable to understand the online activation mechanism and patch it accordingly. It might also come to your mind to just patch the executable and completely bypass the activation phase. And this is where actually things get even more interesting. To also help prevent bypassing the activation phase, developers came up with the idea of packers. Packers work by packaging the actual program inside a certain program. And at runtime, this packer does many checks to make sure it's not being analyzed. These checks include stuff like anti-debugging, anti-analysis, anti-dump, anti-VM, and more. And not just that. Also, heavy obfuscation is used to make reverse engineering a nightmare. This is done using 
techniques like virtualization. For example, this is a simple function that adds two numbers together, and this is the same function protected with the simplest form of virtualization that I could come up with. And it doesn't stop here, we can also add another layer of obfuscation such as MBR or Mixed Boolean Arithmetic. MBR works by taking an arithmetic operation like addition and turning it into a very complicated Boolean expression like this. Just imagine taking the time to reverse engineer all these shenanigans just to find out that you're looking at a simple addition operation. Of course MBR has its own drawbacks like performance but who cares, this is only done at the activation phase. We can also get rid of the simple obvious control flow and employ other control flow obfuscation techniques like control flow flattening that completely destroys the original control flow of the program. You can literally make it a nightmare to reverse engineer a software. However, you have to understand that it's impossible to create an uncrackable program. If a determined hacker has complete control of the program, he will crack it eventually. The whole idea behind these complex algorithms, obfuscation techniques and packers, etc. is to make the process of reverse engineering very hard and very time consuming.